Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we are back with part three of our series looking at backing up to and from a Synology NAS device. So in part one, we backed up our local computers using active backup for business onto the NAS over the network. In part two, we took our cloud data from Google and Microsoft and backed up our entire accounts onto the NAS from the cloud. And in this video, we're going to be looking at backing up this NAS now that we have all of this data stored on it. Additionally, we're going to dive in a bit to snapshot replication, which allows you to replicate the contents of one Synology device to another. So if you ever have some kind of facility issue or something just fails, you can very quickly move your users over to another Synology NAS and have all the files there waiting for you without having to go through the full restoration process. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover here, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is a paid sponsorship from Synology, and they reviewed and approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded for accuracy because we have a lot of instructional information here to present. Now, what we're going to use for backing up today is Hyper Backup, and this is a free application that is in the Synology Package Store. And what we're going to do here is load up the Hyper Backup application which we installed from the package manager a little while ago. And the first thing it wants us to do is set up a new backup job because we don't have any set up yet. And your first decision is where you're going to place the backup. Now what's nice about Hyper Backup is that you can set up multiple jobs that can all do different things. And what we're gonna do is back up now to a cloud storage device. Now I'm gonna select the Synology C2 storage here, but you can also use Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, Microsoft Azure S3. Uh, so you have a lot of other options that you can use. Perhaps you have a cloud account with one of these services already and Hyper Backup will just back right up to that. But we're going to select the C2 storage, which is a service that Synology offers for cloud storage. And we're going to just zoom out here a little bit. Now what I need to do is log into my account. This will be a similar process you'll have to take with the other cloud providers. And once you're logged in, what you need to do is give it permission to use that cloud storage. So we're gonna click allow here. And now that I've done that, I can give a name to this backup. So we'll just call this Office Backup. Now you're also gonna see an option for relinking here, and you'll see that right underneath your creation task. And this is something you would use if you had to restore to a new Synology device. So what you do is you go ahead and start the backup process here and then relink to your existing backup so that you can pick up where you left off. I'm gonna click next now. And as you can see here right now, volume one is checked on. If I check it off, everything goes off. And what I could do is decide to be selective about what I want to back up. So for example, if I just wanted to back up the lawn folder here, I would check on the lawn folder. And anytime I add a new folder to the lawn directory, that will get added uh, to the mix because lawn here is selected as a folder destination. And then of course I could go in and exclude graphics from that if I didn't want that folder in the mix. But if you are selecting folders individually here, just make sure that you make a mental note to come back to this backup job later and add the new folders to the mix because they won't add themselves automatically if you don't have uh, volume one here checked on like that. So just be aware of that. It's not going to pick up the new folders if you're being selective about them. But if you have it selected like this, it will grab everything. Now you're gonna see here, some of the work that we did in the prior videos is waiting for us. So we have the active backup for business directory that contains the PCs that we backed up. We've got the Google Workspace backup that came in from the cloud along with the Microsoft 365 backup. So right now we're just gonna do everything so that if we had a, a total disaster here, I can take this backup and restore it and get all of the other backups uh, back in addition to all the data stored on the NAS. We're gonna click next here and then you have an option for backing up the settings from your applications. So if I check this box here, all of the things that I have installed in their configuration will also get rolled into this backup. And I would definitely suggest turning this on because this makes restoring from a backup all that much easier because your applications will be back the same way your data is returned. Now just note though that not every application you have installed on your Synology NAS is gonna get picked up in this. 
As you can see here, it says that only applications supported for backup are listed. So it's still important to make sure any critical files that you have as part of an application are getting backed up in the folder and file selection that we just looked at. I'm going to click on Next now, and this is where we get into the nitty-gritty of scheduling and versioning. So right now, I'm, this is called Local Storage 1. I guess that's good enough for now. Uh, what it's going to do here is, by default, give us a notification when the task executes, and that way you'll know that it's successfully backed up, or if there's a problem, you'll also uh, get an idea as to what happened there. Uh, you can have it do a detailed file change log. That's off by default, but if you wanted to get a feel for what files had changed since the prior backup, you could enable logging for that. And you can also have the schedule here run. Additionally, there is an integrity check schedule that will make sure that your hyper backup is readable uh, should something go wrong, and that is going to execute once a week here as it goes. Now, you also have the option here for client-side encryption. And what this means is that you could set a password, and that is a password that is client-side, which means that it won't be transmitted anywhere. So that's an added peace of mind that you can do there. Backup rotation will allow you to determine how long revisions are kept. Now, by default, it's going to just keep 256 revisions of a file. And then when the 257th revision is made, it will delete the oldest one to make room for the new ones rolling forward. So that's a pretty simple way to look at it. But you might want to keep a representative sample of what a file looked like four years ago, for example. And that's where Smart Recycle comes in handy. So what will happen here is that we will still have a maximum of 256 backups, but revisions that are older than a month old may get deleted more frequently so that we can keep some representative samples over a period of time. And you can see here that based on the schedule that we set, we would be able to keep a four-year-old revision of this file along with some other versions of it uh, as we roll back to the present. And if I set it for 600 revisions, for example, I could have a revision that dates back 10 years. So you can really get uh, pretty crazy here in how you set all these things up. In my personal setup, I have this option enabled here where I've got a lot of revisions over the last month, which makes a lot of sense if you're working on an active project. And then, of course, the uh, longer term here, I'll always have a couple of older versions to pick from over time. But you can also customize this to your heart's content here and find a revision schedule that works best for you. You can really get granular as to how you put this together. But I'm going to go with Smart Recycle. This has worked for me personally over the last five years or more. And we're just going to roll with it here for simplicity's sake. So now we're going to click Done. And it's going to chew on that for a minute to get everything set up. And when it's done with this, we have the option to back up now. And this is probably a good thing to do just to get your first backup out of the way. And this is the backup that's going to take the longest. But once it's done with this, subsequent backups are really about just updating the files that were changed since the prior one. So your backups in the evening usually should be done by the time you come into the office. Let's let this run here. And when it's done, we'll take a look at what happens next. Now, in the interest of time here, I did make a smaller backup job so that I could show you what happens after a backup is completed. But you'll see here you can keep multiple jobs that will backup files and send them to different destinations. Now, of course, I could click Backup Now to do another backup if I wanted to, but I've already done two backups of this directory. And if we go to my version list here, you can see that uh, both were successful in the log here. Now, if I go over to the Backup Explorer, what I will get is a breakdown of my recent backup jobs here. And you can see that we've done two. And so the only file that I've changed so far is this example RTF. And you can see right here on the most recent backup, it is 440 bytes. But if I go back to a prior backup, it's a 403 byte file. And what I did is I just went in and changed something from one version to the next. But if I wanted to roll back to the old one, I can select that file here and click Restore. And what this will do is put the file back to its original location and overwrite the current version of it. But because I have two versions of this file, if I realize I made a mistake and I want to restore the most recently backed up one, I can do that 
here as well. Additionally, I can click on the download button to download it to my computer locally, or I can click copy here and make a separate file so I can compare the two of them on the hard drive next to each other. Now you also get some backup statistics to track the performance of your backup over time. So if I go over here to the chart, uh, you will see that right now the backup is occupying about 777 megabytes, but we are actually backing up 970 megabytes of files, and that's because we are compressing the data before we write it out. And you can also get a sense here of file count. And just to give you an idea as to what this looks like over time, we'll take a look at my personal NAS here, and you can see that uh, my personal backup has gone from about 2.98 terabytes to about 3.48 terabytes over the last year or so. And this is a good thing to check every once in a while just to make sure that there's nothing going out of control. And this is really important for cloud storage where you might be more limited as to how much data you can store at the remote location. Now you can modify these backup jobs at any time and there are two ways to get at it. Uh, one is to click on the job you want to modify and click on task settings, but you can also get at it uh, from here where you can click on the edit button. And as you can see, we get brought back to a screen where we can add additional directories to the mix. So maybe I want to add the kids folder to my backup job here. And then I can also adjust the schedule and the rotation. Basically everything that we set up initially, you can come back in and change later. And if I click OK here, it will say there's no backup yet, but what it'll do is just add the kids folder now to my existing backups that I have on the drive. So although uh, we are adding kids folders now, we're not gonna see them in the past, but rolling forward, the kids folder will be on the backup and we can take those file revisions over time and restore them as well. Now the Backup Explorer here is really useful for looking through different revisions of backups or finding a specific file that you want to restore or copy. But if you have a need to do a full-on restoration, there's a button for that over here called Restore. And if I click Restore and go to Data and then select the backup job or task that I want to restore, I can actually just do a full-on one click deal to get myself back to where I was at a prior time. So you also here have the option to restore the system configuration from a specific backup time. So remember, in addition to backing up the files, we had the configuration data backed up as well. And every time Hyper Backup runs, it takes all of that configuration data and stores it on the backup destination drive or cloud storage. So for example, if an employee today went through and wiped out all the users and groups, I can go to last night's backup and restore all of those settings to where things were at that time. So I don't have to go through and manually rebuild the entire uh, set of configuration here on the NAS. You do have to restart, of course, there will be some interruption, but you can get yourself back very quickly with just a click here. I'm gonna leave that off for now, but you get the idea as to how that works. And then as far as the files are concerned, I can just click here and restore the entire shared folder and put everything back where it was before somebody went in and messed it all up. And then of course I can browse down here like we did on the Explorer to find the specific revision that I want to restore. So let's say that the incident happened sometime uh, after uh, the last backup, I can go through here and just select the revision that I want to restore, click on the folder here and bring all those files back. I can also narrow it down a little bit here too. So if I just wanted to restore the documents folder, I can uncheck the others here and those will remain at their current revisions, but documents will go back to the revision that we're specifying here. Now we're also gonna be given the option to restore the application data that we backed up from the supported Synology apps that we saw earlier. I'm just gonna click next here. And then when I click done, what's going to happen is it's going to take all those files and bring back the revision that I specified to the live production environment here. And as you can see, uh, that's done. And we are now back to where we were before all the shenanigans started here in the office. Now remember, we also backed up our active backup data for Microsoft 365 and Workspace along with our local computers that we backed up using active backup for business. And again, those were covered in parts one and two in this series. And once my big backup job completes to the external drive, all of that backup data is going to be safe on here too, and presumably in the cloud once that backup finishes up. And if you need to repoint your active backup for business 
application later should you have to restore to new hardware. If you go to storage here, you can go here and click relink and point it at the directory that you restored to in order to get those things back up and running. As far as the active backup for 365 and workspace, if you do not have a successful restoration, uh, what you can do, provided the files made it back okay, is go over to task list here, go to create, and then click on relink an existing backup task. And if you point that at the directory where the files you backed up are located, that will ingest and get you back up and running again with your full backups. Now, Hyper Backup works quite well, but there is definitely some restoration time involved should you have a system failure. And if you need to have your files available to you immediately, that's where snapshot replication might be a better solution. And that's what we're gonna dive into now. Now, in order to get this going though, we need to have a second Synology NAS. So let me go get one and set it up and I'll show you what snapshot replication is all about. Now, you do need to make sure that your Synology NAS is compatible with snapshot replication. You can see a list of models on the snapshot replication page on the Synology website. For this demo, we have two Intel powered Synology NASs, the 1019 Plus here, along with the DS218 Plus, and both of these are powerful enough for this feature. Now, you do need to find snapshot replication in the package center and install it, and it needs to be running on both the destination device, this one, and the source device, this one. Now, we're going to be flipping back and forth a little bit between the two devices, but you'll be able to tell the difference here because our source device has this nice painted background, whereas the destination will just have a regular blue background here. But you can see we've got snapshot replication running on both sides. And what I'm going to do here is open up the application. Now, we've covered doing snapshots locally using the BTRFS file system in a prior video. But what we're going to be doing here is making that replication happen from one Synology NAS here to another over the network or the internet. So I'm gonna go over here to the replication section and I'm going to go over here and click on create. Now before we get started, you should make sure that your Synology NAS devices both have a static IP address on your local network. It just makes it easier for everything to find each other. And in the wizard here, we're going to select a remote task type. Now, even though these are on the same network, it is remote in the sense that we're going to be copying from one server, this one, to another, this one. And of course, this doesn't have to be on your local network. You can move them off-site as well. So I'm going to click on Next here. And what it's asking me for is the IP address of the destination NAS device. And my IP address for the destination here is 192.168.2.139 on my local network. So I'm going to type that in real quick. And then I also have to type in a username and password for this NAS. And that user has to have access, of course, to the uh, replication package that you installed. Another thing I recommend you do is use encrypted connections, especially if you're going to be doing this over the internet. And as far as advanced settings go, you can change the port numbers that you are using for this. So if you wanted to map a specific port, you can do that. Uh, you can also, of course, configure things within a VPN arrangement and use custom ports for that as well. And there's a lot of depth to this feature that we're not gonna be able to cover in this video, but we are going to get a basic uh, kind of connection going here. And then maybe in a future one, we can really dive into some of the advanced features of this particular uh, component of the Synology uh, NAS system here. So we're gonna click on Next now. And if you have that package running, it will automatically get going on the remote server here, as you can see. And what I'm going to do is select what volume on the remote server I want to store my data on. And this server only has a single volume called volume one. So I'm going to click on next. And now I'm going to select the folders that I want to replicate. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to select one right now, but we could do all of them if we wanted to. And all of these would be kept in sync with each other. But we're gonna start off with just the lawn folder here and you'll see how it structures everything when we get it set up. Now, the other thing I can do right now is get the initial copy done over the network. It estimates that this is gonna be about 11 minutes, and then it will sync immediately after the creation of the replication task. Uh, but I could also sneaker net it, 
and actually uh, store something on an external hard drive and ship it out to the destination and use that to get me going initially. But because we're on the same network here, I think we can do it this way. Now, just like the backup scenario, you can set a schedule. This doesn't happen in real time. It only happens when it fires off. So I could set it for uh, every day at midnight, for example, but I could actually have it run every hour or even more frequently than that. So it's up to you how you want to handle this, but we'll, sit, we'll stick with uh, hourly actually for this right now. And that way every hour we're going to get another snapshot passed down. And like the hyper backup, you can keep uh, different revisions of the files as well through some of the uh, retention schedules there. So we're going to click on next here. And then we're going to have that retention policy on. We're going to set it to 128. And what we're determining here is how many snapshots to retain. Like Hyper Backup, it's efficient in that it's not going to re-back up the same file if it hasn't changed. So the actual amount of storage you need is going to vary based on how often your files are changing. Now, the default here is 128 snapshots. And when you get to 129, it will delete the oldest file and keep rolling forward from there. You can also set it by days here. So we can say keep the last week and then delete anything older. And then you can do an advanced retention policy, which is kind of similar to the uh, smart feature we saw on the hyper backup example earlier. And you can tweak this to get it set the way you want. I'm going to keep it simple for now and just do 128. And we're going to click on next here. Now, if you are doing a local snapshot, you can also have your NAS send that snapshot to the remote server when it fires off locally. We're going to leave that off for now, but it might be something some of you may want to enable. And then over here, you can actually set the time zone in the snapshot name if you are doing multiple snapshots across different parts of your enterprise around the world. But we're not that big of an organization, and we're going to leave that off. And now what we're going to do is just confirm our settings here and click Done. And when we do this, we will get an initial snapshot sent from this NAS to this one. And then we can roll forward from there. So let's let this thing do its thing. And when it's done, we'll take a look and see what happens. So our first snapshot here was a success. And if I click on the Info button, I can get a little bit more information. So it ran three minutes ago. Our next run is 45 minutes from now. And if I click the refresh button here on the estimated data size, you'll see that our next run is only going to be 1.8 megabytes because remember, only things that change get sent over. And if you're using a small amount of data like I am here, you could probably have this run every hour without causing too many issues. But if you're working on big files, uh, that of course will be a different story. So everyone's mileage will vary based on what the right intervals are to set here. You also get some statistics that will collect over time along with your data transfer rate. And then, of course, you can look further into the topology that you've set up. We're going one to one right now, but there are a lot of ways that you can go well beyond that, which is beyond the scope of this video. Now, if I go over to the other device, you'll see now that we have a LAN folder, just like the one on our source device, now on the destination. And all of the files are here and accessible. So for example, I have a document called test document here, and I can actually open it up with the text editor. But if I tried to change something on the document and save it, I'm going to get an error because all of these files are read only. So what we're doing here is just passing the data from the source to the destination. And you can't do anything to the destination data, but you can, of course, actively work on the data on the source. And then when we have another snapshot go out, it'll take all that new data and bring it over to the destination. Now on the source NAS, I can add data to the mix and save it because this is the uh, source of the file. And what I could even do is go and force the snapshot to fire off again. So I can go in here and click on sync now. And what this will do is send another snapshot over even though my hour hasn't run out yet. Now also here you can see that it's clicked on the lock check mark and what this will do is prevent this manual sync from being deleted according to my retention policy. So if you have a really good moment in time that you just want to lock in, if you do a snapshot and click lock, this revision will not be deleted until you do it yourself. So I'm going to click OK here and it's going to fire off. And this is going to go a lot quicker than the last run that we did. 
because we're only sending just the changes to the data from our initial uh, download here. So we're going to let that run. It looks like it's going to be done pretty quickly here. And when it completes, when we go back over to our remote device here and look at that file again, uh, you will see that the new data is here. But of course, again, this is read only on the remote side. But this gives you an idea as to how all of this works. Now we can also do some data recovery here too. So if I go over to recovery and I click on recover, I can then go through the list of snapshots that were taken. So this is the one that we just did here at the top but I could go and revert back to this one. And if I click on that one and go to browse, I will have to answer in the affirmative to this question here about making the snapshot visible for the shared folder. So I'll enable that option now. And we'll let that process here. And now, as you can see, I can go into the file station and dig through those prior examples. So for example, in this case, uh, you can see that my snapshots are all located here. And this is our test document that we were working on earlier. And you can see this is the one that does not have the change that was made to it. Now I can't change the file in the snapshot, but what I can do is copy the file out. I could even bring it back to the original directory here and overwrite the one that's currently in there. Uh, so you can do something like that for an individual uh, file restoration if you wanna go that route. And as you can see, I just dragged that file over. And if I go back to the folder here and look at it, uh, it should now have that uh, text that we added removed. And it's back to where it was earlier. And then, of course, I can jump back to the one that we did after that and take a look at that. And there's the extra data there. I can go ahead and just redrag that one over and copy it back over. So you can do that with an individual snapshot if you want. Uh, what you can also do, though, is restore the entire snapshot, which would basically return that shared folder to exactly where it was when that snapshot was taken. And this works very similar uh, when you just do a local snapshot as well. But the difference is, is that the snapshot data is not only located on here, it's also located here. And should we have some kind of catastrophe here, we can pretty easily get going on the new NAS. Let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna go back to the source unit here. And if I go over to recovery and select the snapshot that we're working with, if I click on action here and I go to switch over, what this will do is switch the relationship. So right now, this is the source and this is the destination. So this one is read only, this one I have full access to. If I click switch over, the relationship will reverse. So let's click on that real quick. And what it's gonna do is it's going to send over a new snapshot, and then it's going to flip the relationship here of these devices. And you can see here the new source is going to be the remote, and the new destination is going to be the former source. So let's click on switch over here and see what happens. And we'll let that process. And you'll probably want to have your users not do any changes to the data during this period of time. But it should go pretty quickly if you're keeping your snapshots up to date. So let's let that finish up here. It shouldn't take too long. And when it's done, we'll see what happens. All right, that finished up. And as you can see here, our DS1019 that used to be the source is now the destination. And if I go over to my lawn folder here and try to edit that document that we've been playing with, and go to save it, you'll see we got the same error message we got before on the other server. So let's go jump over to the other one and we'll go into our lawn folder over here and we'll go ahead and edit that file. I can add more, hit file, save, and that let me save it because this uh, NAS now is now the master and so everything that we're doing will get snapshotted back to this one, but this one is not going to allow us to edit anything until we switch the relationship over again. So you can see how you can take this thing down for maintenance, point everybody at the uh, new NAS for continuing their work, and then when the maintenance is done, you can do another switch over and go back to how you had it before, and it'll push another snapshot back over and you can continue on your existing NAS. So this is a lot quicker than having to restore data, especially for a maintenance event. You can keep everybody working, just point them at the new IP address for the other NAS, make sure you've got all your usernames synced up, and it's a pretty easy switchover when you need to do a little work on one of your devices. 
Now you'll recall in our prior videos, we covered Active Backup for Business along with Active Backup for Google Workspace and Microsoft 365. And if you use snapshot replication to back up the directories that Active Backup is using, you can also transition over to a secondary NAS should you have a catastrophic event. So what I did here with my Active Backup for Business directory is switched it over to this remote server as the new location of the source data, just like we did a few minutes ago with my LAN folder. And if I go over here to Active Backup for Business, you can see right now it's a blank slate. But if I go to Storage and click on Relink, you'll see that it automatically found the data that we have been replicating to this device. And although the credentials are not stored here and we do have to reset those things to get everything back up and running, we will have the data in place. So once we get those PCs relinked to this new server, all of their data will be safely stored still on this new device, just like it was on the old one. And for one of our cloud backups, we'll load up Active Backup for Microsoft 365 on this new NAS device. And instead of creating a new task like I did before, I'm going to relink an existing task. And just like before, it found the data that we had replicated over from the other device. And if I click Done here, it will have successfully relinked everything back up and I can continue from where I last left off. And as you can see here, things are now populated and we can continue to protect our cloud data. Now, what happens if you have a catastrophe and you lose the NAS physically and you can't do the switchover thing to negotiate who is doing what? Well, there is an option for that. And inside of the recovery section here, if I go over to action, I can force a failover here. You can also set this to go automatically. Uh, what'll happen here is that if I force the failover, it will not worry about communicating back to the source. And when I click this, what'll happen is that my secondary NAS here will now make that folder writable and I can get my users over to this to continue their work. And then after we get everything back up and running and uh, rebuild the building, uh, we can do what's called a reprotect, which will reestablish all of these relationships between the NAS devices so you can pick out who the permanent source will be. So you can see how very quickly you can get yourself back up and running here, even if you have a catastrophe that blows out all the data. I unplugged this thing completely, and what's happening right now is I initiated the failover, and soon, uh, the new one here will be ready to go with the last snapshot that it had to work with. So if you set this to go hourly, uh, you have a pretty good chance of retaining most of your data should something go wrong. And what you can also do, as I mentioned, is set it up initially at your headquarters and then ship it out. And if you go back in and change the destination IP address, you can uh, set everything to work over the internet as well. I'm going to let this finish processing its failover, and when it's done, I'll show you how to reset the IP address so you can bring these to a remote location after their initial snapshot. So now in looking at the task information on our backup server here, you can see that we're in a failover state, so we do have to do something to reestablish the relationship. Now what I did is I plugged the other one back in after its catastrophe, and so they're aware of each other again, but it's not going to start syncing up until I take some action to re-protect things. So I'm going to go over here to recovery. And again, we're still on this one here. And I'm going to go over to action, re-protect. And so what I'm going to do here is basically uh, assign the new server. So I can say, well, we had a failover. This became the server, but now I'm ready for this one to be the server again. So we're going to select the new source server will be the, two nine, uh, the 1019. And I'm going to reprotect the data from this one because we made some changes while this one was getting brought back up. So if I click reprotect here, what's going to happen is we're going to run a new snapshot from here to there. And then this one will take over once that snapshot finishes its uh, transmission <laughs> from one to the other here. So you can see both how you can do a switchover when you can control the situation and how you can do a failover if you have a catastrophic event. 
All right, so our reprotection is complete, and you can see now that remote server is once again the destination server, and our 1019 is once again the source server. And if I go over to that machine here and click info, you can see that it is giving us the same information here. So we have basically uh, failed over from this one to this one and then reprotected back, and now they will uh, sync up where this one will then keep sending its snapshots over. And you get a feel now, I think, for how this works. Now let's say we want to move this one off-site and still maintain the relationship here. We don't have to reset up the whole thing. So if I go back to our source unit here, the 1019, and go over to Replication and select our uh, snapshot here and go to Action Edit, I can change the IP address here to something else without having to rebuild everything. It's just going to start communicating to a different IP versus where it was before. And then that allows us to get everything established here on a local network where we have the most bandwidth. We can then move it off site and then just transfer those incremental snapshots as time goes on. And that's a really easy way, I think, to get up and running. So there you go, two different ways you can get your Synology NAS data backed up both within your facility and done off-site, and you can do it in a way that it all happens in the background. You do, of course, want to monitor it to make sure everything is working correctly, but you can set up multiple hyper backup jobs and also have this snapshot replication working at the same time. So you've got a lot of options to recover your data should something go wrong. And I think if you have some kind of catastrophe, having more options is better than having fewer ones. And of course, snapshot replication makes a lot of sense for high availability with minimal restore time, but hyper backup also can work quite well, even though it might take a little bit longer to get your data back in place. It is a little more simple to operate. But either way, you've got options here, and let me know what you think down in the comments below. This was a great series to do because I learned a lot putting this video together, and I've implemented some of these things already into my workflow, and I would love to hear from you about things you'd like for me to cover in future videos. And I want to thank Synology for their support of the channel, and that's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching.